Hello and welcome to Hard Money. I'm Natalie Brunel. We're going to focus a lot of this week's show on the effects of surging inflation around the world. Now here in the US, the latest CPI print is 9.1%, which is the highest in four decades. Take a look at this graph from market analyst Charlie Bolello, showing a breakdown in year-over-year -year price increases. Food at home and electricity have surged 12 and 13%, while gasoline is up nearly 60% and fuel oil up nearly 100%. Now shelter appears to be up only 5%, but the way it's calculated in the CPI grossly understates the real inflation in homes and rent. Speaking of homes, mortgage payments are up more than 40% over the last year due to rising interest rates, putting a major strain on the average American household. This affects demand and crushes sales, which will bring down real estate prices, but with a lag. Asking prices are already being slashed in markets across the U.S., according to Redfin. As for the Fed, the market expects it to continue to aggressively hike interest rates. In fact, the market is now giving a 33% chance that the Fed will increase rates a whole percentage point at the next FOMC meeting. This would mark the single largest rate hike the Federal Reserve has done since 1981. The hikes have been crushing traditional stocks and crypto for months now. The S&P 500 so far posting one of its worst year-to-date returns in history, down more than 15% since January. Now, 9.1% official CPI here in the U.S. is bad, but many other countries are facing much worse inflation. Let's take a look. First, across Europe, close to our range, 8.6% inflation year over year, but that's the highest recording ever. In Nigeria, inflation hit a five-year high of 18.6%, according to Reuters, with some economists, though, estimating it's closer to 31%. In Pakistan, inflation soared to 45% year-over-year, and the country just reached a deal with the IMF for a $6 billion bailout. In Argentina, where citizens continue to protest rising prices, the last official inflation rate came in at 61%. In Lebanon, inflation has hit a staggering 211%, and in Venezuela, inflation was last measured at 151% year-over-year, but the Bolivar has reportedly lost 99% of its value against the U.S. dollar just since 2020. A big story this year has been the strength of the dollar, up nearly 12% on the year and 3% on the month. But the Dixie, the U.S. dollar index, has finally started to cool off over the last few trading days. The Dixie measures the strength of the dollar against six major foreign currencies, and a 12% move up was an explosive move in currency markets around the world. Risk assets generally like the dollar down, which is likely why we started the week seeing those assets in the green, but it could be just a temporary relief rally. Part of the recent strength in the dollar is seen as a sign that investors were fleeing to safety as fears of a recession grew. But this could also be seen as severe weakness in the other foreign currencies, particularly the euro and the yen, which constitute 70% of the Dixie's components. The euro has been slumping heavily as investors fear a recession is on the horizon, and Europe is struggling with slowing economic growth and an energy crisis amid the Russia-Ukraine war. This has caused the price of energy in the euro market to soar, and the rate of inflation is currently at record highs in the eurozone. All of this led to the euro US dollar exchange rate breaking below $1 for the first time in 20 years. The euro has currently depreciated 10.5% against the dollar year to date. Now, the other major currency crashing against the dollar is the Japanese yen. The world's third largest currency by trading volume is down 16.5% against the dollar this year alone. This is the result of the Bank of Japan performing yield curve control, which is where they buy an unlimited amount of their own bonds to peg the interest rate at a predetermined rate. The BOJ has now printed billions and billions of yen to buy its benchmark 10-year bonds to maintain the peg at 0.25%, and this has resulted in significant pressure on the yen. Part of the reason the BOJ has to do this is because Japan is the most indebted country in the world with a debt-to-GDP of over 260%. As a result, it is extremely sensitive to any increase in interest rates. The Bank of Japan's only choice is to abandon the peg and risk the borrowing costs going up substantially or continue to print yen to maintain the peg at the expense of the currency. Now, luckily for the BOJ, some help for the crashing yen may soon be on its way from the U.S. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, in a meeting with Japan's finance minister, discussed the yen's rapid recent evaluation and said the U.S. will continue to consult closely on exchange markets and cooperate on currency issues in line with the G7 and G20 commitments. Yellen went on further to say that the exchange rate interventions were only warranted in, quote, rare and exceptional circumstances. All of this points to the same potential outcome, central banks resorting back to printing money and buying bonds as credit markets and currency markets begin to tremble and shake at the thought of central banks no longer being there to prop things up.
Meanwhile, the war between Russia and Ukraine is having a major impact on prices in both the energy and agricultural sectors. In Europe and Germany in particular, as we reported last week, energy prices are skyrocketing. According to the Financial Times, EU members are being told to cut gas consumption immediately, and the European Commission is warning that without conservation, the continent risks running short of the fuel it needs this winter. The International Energy Agency, which is a watchdog group, says Europe needs to add stricter measures, including restricting air conditioning demand and auctioning gas supplies to the industry. Environmental concerns and questionable propaganda around the ESG movement have put many individuals and organizations in a difficult position. The farmer protests that began in the Netherlands have now grown to include farmer groups in Spain, Poland, and Italy. New EU regulations would force farmers to cut their use of nitrogen fertilizers, and coupled with the increased cost of gasoline, many of those protesting fear an end to their way of life. The World Economic Forum is attempting to do some damage control, but the internet never forgets. In the face of ongoing protests in Sri Lanka over the crumbling state of the economy there, the WEF has deleted an article from 2018 by the former prime minister, we mentioned that article last week, about how ESG policies would, quote, make Sri Lanka rich by 2025. But Sri Lankans are not alone in their economic hardship. The cost of living is going up just about everywhere, and citizens the world over have taken to the streets to protest. From Europe to Africa to Latin America and Asia, citizens are finding it more and more difficult to make ends meet. So why is that? At the heart of all the unrest we are seeing is inflation, a broken monetary system, and governments falling into the same traps time and time again. The temptation to print more money to address short-term problems have always proved too strong and will likely be the response to the impending recession. Before we move on, let's get to some Bitcoin headlines. Despite more volatility in the dollar-denominated world, Bitcoin continues producing new blocks about every 10 minutes. The mining industry, though, has seen a major drop in profitability, prompting many debt-laden, publicly traded mining companies to sell their Bitcoin reserves. 28 public miners have sold around 13,000 Bitcoin year to date, according to SEC filings, and BitFarms and Core Scientific have sold about half of their Bitcoin reserves thus far, also according to the SEC. One of the biggest stories in Bitcoin this week came from Elon Musk. We've learned Tesla, which once tweeted it had diamond hands, has sold 75% of its Bitcoin holdings. Musk said the sale wasn't a verdict on Bitcoin, but was made to improve Tesla's cash position due to uncertainty over COVID-19 restrictions in China, which impacted its Shanghai Gigafactory. He added that the company was open to increasing its holdings in the future. Tesla did not sell its Dogecoin, and its balance sheet now has about $218 million in digital assets, down from the $1.5 billion when it first bought Bitcoin last February. It's not all bad news, though. Sustainable Bitcoin miner CleanSpark recently announced the purchase of over 1,000 new mining rigs, upping their mining capacity by 93 petahash. And that's a lot. And how's this for a home run? In the world of sports, the New York Yankees have announced a partnership with NYDIG that would allow employees to get paid in Bitcoin. That is a first in Major League Baseball. And finally, news from Russia on Bitcoin. Despite officials seeming bullish on Bitcoin just a few months ago, with one official even alluding to oil payments in Bitcoin in the future, Vladimir Putin has officially signed a law banning Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as a means of payment for goods and services in Russia. Today's guest, Alex Gladstein, wrote on Twitter, quote, not surprising, Bitcoin Bitcoin is bad for dictators who want to control everything and continue to force the population to use their own fiat currencies. And coming up after the break, I'll speak with Alex Gladstein, the chief strategy officer of the Human Rights Foundation. We'll get his take on the latest updates from around the world and discuss the implications of the inflation crisis around the globe. Don't go away.
Welcome back to Hard Money. Joining me this week is Alex Gladstein, Chief Strategy Officer for the Human Rights Foundation and author of Check Your Financial Privilege. Alex, thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. Well, I want to talk to you about the inflation crises that we see playing out across the world. We think 9.1% is bad here in the U.S., but we're seeing hundreds of percent in some other countries. Can you talk to us about what people need to know? Because you have so much experience on the ground with folks that are dealing with the rising cost of living and human rights violations in different countries. Sure. Well, look, we're still in the fiat standard, for better or worse. And obviously for us <laughs> here, we think uh, for worse. But the reality is we're still in the fiat standard. And in that world, there's only one money, and that's the U.S. dollar. What happens during crises like this is that people run out of dollars. And when they run out of dollars, they can't pay their debts. Uh, and these sovereigns cannot get the food and energy they need to satisfy the populations. So you have economic collapse and uprising. Uh, right now, you have 30% or more inflation for more than 1 billion people, um, which is just a staggering, uh, absolutely devastating reality. You also have uh, double digit food inflation for another two and a half billion people when you consider that India, the United States, the EU um, are all very close to nine to 10 percent inflation. That means their food inflation is, is double digits. So no one's kind of like uh, not feeling the pressure right now. The only major country that doesn't have like very high inflation at the moment from what their own uh, kind of statisticians are telling us is China. And they're all on lockdown. You know, they're not there's not a whole, a whole lot of inflation there because no one's buying anything because they're all in lockdown. So no one's doing very well right now. Um, and we're kind of all sort of prisoners uh, of this of this fiat currency system is, is the reality. So what is causing this? Is it the rising interest rates by the Fed? Is it the war in Russia, Ukraine? What's contributing to this? Is it a combination? Yeah, well, when you look back at history, you have episodes like the Asian financial crisis uh, I think that you have over leveraged uh, industries in different areas, whether they be, you know, in real estate, in uh, consumer borrowing, and then uh, the bubble bursts. And then what ends up happening in a lot of these countries is, you know, they don't have the ability to access dollars and they cannot pay off their own debts. And then things spiral even more out of control and you get the kind of double digit, triple digit inflation that we're seeing. This has been cyclical. We've seen this over and over again over the last five decades in the post-71 political economy. Um, and you know, even the US government is, is having issues. Even the country that can issue the currency that everybody else needs is having issues. Um, so you know, this, this brings people like me to be interested in, in, in a Bitcoin standard and in a different paradigm, um, because maybe we could live in a world where you know, all countries would have equal access to the reserve currency. Um, all countries would be able to use their energy reserves to create the, the world reserve currency. That would be a very different world than today, where only one country can issue it at its pleasure. So that's kind of what, what I'm here for. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit more about that, because Bitcoin's adoption is growing faster in developing nations, and the use case may, may have more of a spotlight on it, especially in these crazy inflationary times. Can you talk about how Bitcoin can fix some of the issues we're seeing playing out across, across the globe? You have a lot of people across the world in Argentina, Turkey, Cuba, the Philippines, who got into Bitcoin sometime in the last five years, right? Um, and a lot of them are doing well. I mean, a lot of them educated themselves, learned how to save in an asset that couldn't be confiscated. Uh, for a lot of them, Bitcoin has been extremely valuable. For people who got into it a little more recently, like let's say in the last year or so, you know, maybe they're not doing so well. But I, I think that highlights the, 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 the reality that we're still in the fiat standard. And that's why, you know, some people are interested in, in stable coins and in trying to bring that technology to Bitcoin uh, and trying to get Bitcoin users to be able to get dollar exposure. Personally, I think that's kind of a moral imperative. I think we live in a world where people need Bitcoin and dollars for now. So I think we'll, we'll see the rise of uh, open source non-KYC wallets uh, in the coming year or two that allow people to interact with both, which I think will be great. And, and that, that will be a absolute solution for billions of people. So again, I think more, we have this moral imperative to get as many people as possible onto Bitcoin and then help those people get dollar exposure where they need it. Before I let you go, Alex, you had a compelling, poignant reaction to when Vladimir Putin said he's gonna ban Bitcoin payments. Can you offer us that message? Yeah, sure. Well, look, I think that a lot of people in the media, in the mainstream media, they thought that Bitcoin would be good for 
Putin because it could allow him to get around sanctions. I think that that's a very kind of surface level take. The deeper take is that Bitcoin empowers individuals in society and takes away power from the government. And anything that does that, dictators are not going to like very much. So you have Putin coming in here and signing a law uh, the other day, I think on the 14th, um, which prevents people in Russia from using Bitcoin and cryptocurrency for payments. So, you know, he's worried about Bitcoin eating into that. Um, and you know what? He, he's got to kind of protect his ship, his economic ship from sinking. And, and to do that, he needs to keep his, his population away from Bitcoin. Um, at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I, I think you'd agree a lot of people, you know, accuse Bitcoin of being the iceberg that sinks these, these states. And in reality, it's not. It's the lifeboat, right? So we want to get the lifeboat in, as many, in the hands of as many Russians as possible and in the hands of as many Sri Lankans as possible. I think Sri Lanka was the, has been the, the moment, the, the, the image of a, debt, a third world debt crisis and what it means to society. Um, and I think that in the future, uh, it is very possible that people can avoid the mistakes of their corrupt rulers by opting into Bitcoin. So, I mean, we remain hopeful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alex. Anything you're going to be watching for this week or in the coming weeks, just as far as Bitcoin or macro news in general? Yeah, I mean, I would continue to look at countries in, in the emerging markets that have inflation crises. I mean, we're looking at Sudan, we're looking at Egypt, we're looking at Mozambique, we're looking at Ecuador. There are nationwide protests. Um, and it's going to lead to, you know, look at Pakistan. I think what's happening is you're getting IMF bailouts everywhere. Countries are losing their national sovereignty as a result of this trade-off that they make, which is part of this fiat system. Uh, I would continue to look at that. And I would continue to expect, you know, tight times for Bitcoin while the Fed continues to tighten. I mean, it impacts everybody around the world. I mean, the Fed says it wants to tighten to try and fight price inflation in the United States. As you're watching right now, an externality of that is, you know, massive economic collapse around the world. And again, that's just sort of part and parcel of our system. So I'd pay attention to what they're doing. Uh, you know, in, in you know, at 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 the Fed, at the heart of the system, um, and then keep building. But uh, thanks again for having me on. Building in this bear market and such a great value proposition right now for Bitcoin. I think around the world. Thanks so much, Alex. Oh, hi, I'm Max Tatter, and this, of course, is Plucky. I got a new job. I'm now Plucky's trainer. We're doing some of these uh, sit-ups here. He wants to get as strong as possible for the fiat money apocalypse. That's right, Max. We're both heading into the fiat money apocalypse and I'm stacking sets over strong Bitcoin. Oh, that's so smart, Plucky. How did you get so smart? Get the Swan app. Here at home, inflation sticker shock is hitting millions of Americans hard. Inflation in the U.S. is the highest it's been in four decades. Driving inflation. 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 Hyperinflation. Turn on the news and you'll hear it. Inflation hitting every sector of the economy. Instead of three gallons of milk, we get one. But what is inflation? And more importantly, how did we get here? Inflation is made in Washington because only Washington can create money. What produces it? It's too much government spending and too much government creation of money and nothing else. Inflation boils down to the expansion of the supply of money and credit. The government and mainstream media have tried to redefine inflation to just mean rising prices, finding all sorts of scapegoats. But it's the government that creates inflation and rising costs are just one of the results, placing a heavy tax on the working class. I think in 2021, our central bank let us down uh, quite badly. It was mm -hmm. confidently dismissing concerns about inflation as transitory. From President Biden to Fed Chair Jerome Powell, American leaders say inflation is their number one priority. In order to tame it, we've seen hiking interest rates amid record debt levels and attempts at destroying demand without initiating a deflationary bust. But in June, the CPI in the U.S. that was supposed to be transitory hit a new high of 9.1 percent. 
So when will inflation finally cool? Or will we see stagflation for months or years to come? Inflation numbers in 21, which we will see rising, are of a temporary nature. That was European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde speaking just a year ago about global inflation numbers. Today, inflation in Europe has hit record levels, prompting what's supposed to be the first interest rate hike in the Eurozone in a decade. If you simply print lots of money at a time when you're producing less, you've got a classic case of too much money chasing too few goods, and the result of that is inflation. The last two years have been a perfect storm of inflationary chaos sparked by pandemic lockdowns that crunch supply chains and central bank monetary policy of printing on overdrive. As you zoom out to other countries around the world, to emerging markets and developing nations dependent on the dollar, inflation numbers are even more staggering, prompting civil unrest as the cost of living becomes unsustainable. What you're seeing is that the inflation isn't just this U.S. phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon. You can see it with all central banks, that they're now worried about inflation when they weren't before. This is Sri Lanka. Similar scenes playing out in Peru, Greece, Sudan, Argentina, Lebanon, Pakistan and elsewhere as people around the world are reacting to the shockwaves of skyrocketing food, shelter and gas prices, of basic necessities that are now growing scarce in a world of abundant money. You should be asking yourself the question, you know, what do we think is going on here? You know, if we keep printing money at this rate, what will happen? This is what happens in a world of easy money. But there are many who argue Bitcoin could do quite a bit to fix this. How is inflation congruent with humanity thriving in a technology-driven world? Bitcoin is the most hopeful path. So the whole question was, how hard is Bitcoin? How is it going to hold up in the long term as commodity money? And so the longer it goes, the more of its properties you understand, it's doing quite well. And when times are growing harder, many are looking to a new form of hard money for a digital world to usher in a parallel system free of the chains of inflation. When the currency is expanding at 5% a year, it's kind of a nuisance. When you go to Argentina or Turkey and it's expanding at 50% a year, it's a life or death situation. Welcome back to Hard Money. It is time for our weekly macro segment featuring Andy Edstrom, CFA and author of Why Buy Bitcoin. Andy, last week we spoke about CPI's new high, 10-year treasury yields, and expectations for Fed action. What have we learned since that CPI print? Well, Natalie, the recent 9.1% CPI number gives the Fed even more of a green light to be aggressive with rate hikes, which are intended to stabilize consumer prices. If the Fed were to raise rates by a full percentage point in one meeting, it would be the first time they'd done that since 1981. However, there has been some commentary from Fed governors the past few days, which indicate that they're leaning more toward a 75 basis point rate hike rather than the full 1%. Well, Andy, last week we spoke about various economic indicators that are pointing toward recession. A lot of people think we're already in one. What is the new data on this front? The market is expecting the Fed to raise rates until it's pretty clear we're in a recession, then stop, and then start cutting rates again. Now, there is precedent for this type of Fed action. For example, in the 1970s, which was a persistently high inflationary decade, the Fed still cut rates when there was a recession, even though CPI was elevated. It's possible that we see the same dynamic here in the 2020s. Well, I know another topic that investors are focused on right now is yield curve inversion. Tell us what's going on here. So this is the bond market giving us yet another recessionary signal in the form of the twos and tens treasury yield curve inversion. So the two-year treasury yield rose above the 10-year yield back in spring of this year, and it has inverted to the steepest level recently uh, since the year 2000. Um, this has been a pretty reliable indicator in the past of a recession. It's preceded nearly all recessions since the 1970s. Um, it doesn't always mean a recession is coming immediately, though. The average lag time between the twos, tens inversion and an actual recession coming is about a year. 
Well, Andy, lastly, let's talk about the recent strength of the US dollar, which was at its highest level in 20 years when measured by the Dixie Index, but might be rolling over. What can you tell us? So one interpretation is that the dollar is strong because investors are nervous, and so they're fleeing to safety. Uh, another interpretation is that the euro and the yen, which are the other side of the DXY index, are weakening. And so the movement upward in the DXY just indicates relative weakness of the euro and the yen. Um, either way, the strength of the dollar is very important for global financial stability because uh, there are lots of dollar denominated debts throughout the world. And so it's, it can be stressful on the system when the dollar is rising because it increases the risk uh, that those debt instruments may face defaults and therefore threaten uh, financial stability. Well, thank you so much, Andy, as always. Next week, I'm sure we'll be talking about the Fed's rate decision, as well as other important economic data and market movements. Thank you so much for watching this week's edition of Hard Money. Our goal is to give you the latest headlines impacting Bitcoin and the global economy, while bringing you original interviews straight from the biggest names in the space. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'll see you next week.